Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Kyle Cleveland with Temple University, Japan. This is ICAST, a multimedia portal through our Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies. And today we have with us Karen Hill Anton. Karen is the author of a new book called From Breastpock Mountain, A View, a Memoir. Karen is also, for many years, was the author of a column in the Japan Times called Crossing Cultures. It would take me 10 minutes to go through her biography. She has been a consultant for many companies, including for two prime ministers. And she was a member of the Temple Board of Governors for quite a number of years. And I've known Karen, I suppose, going on 20 years or more. As this event was coming together, I got a kind note from both Kurt Patterson, who had been our dean, and Matt Wilson, who is our current dean. And they both extended their best wishes. As by the way, Jeff Kingston, the head of our Asian Studies program, asked me to say hello. Oh, great. And Dean Patterson and Dean Wilson just wanted to express their gratitude for all the work that you put into TUJ, even at a time in the post-bubble economy when the university's status was somewhat tenuous. And <laughs> <laughs> those are probably tales we should not tell outside of school. Um, but cool you're just constant uh, support for the university. And also with us today, we have Ben Karp. Ben Karp is an ICAS fellow. Ben has done a number of events with us through our ICAS, through our institute. Ben is a graduate of Yale University. He is uh, an adjunct faculty as well. I think right now at Waseda, he's also taught at TUJ. And you may be wondering why both Ben and I are moderating actually Ben and I approached Karen, I think on the same day, independently of one another, yeah. asking if we could do a podcast with her, not knowing that we had both um, approached her. That's and true. because Ben and I had done a podcast previously, we decided to, to kind of join in together. So this is going to be kind of a far reaching conversation. It's going to be focused primarily on Karen's book, The View from Best Park Mountain, and her very unique life trajectory. So welcome, Karen and Ben. The thank first you, question you. that I wanted to put to you was, well, not a question, maybe it's a statement. F. Scott Fitzgerald, the writer, once said, there are no second him. acts in American life. There are no second acts in American life. And yet, when I look at your life trajectory, it seems like you've lived a dozen lives. I mean, the diversity of your experience, and for those of you who have not read this book, Karen, you had mentioned it's a page turner. It really is. I was up very late last night. I, I couldn't put it down. And um, what struck me about it was the incredible diversity of experience that you've had over your life experience. Could you speak to that notion of the many lives that you have lived? Right. Well, first thing I will say, uh, I think F. Scott, <clears throat> F. Scott Fitzgerald um, proves that not to listen <laughs> to everything you hear, even from uh, some of our premier writers. As, as, as you uh, know and, and can see from my memoir, then my life is basically unplanned. And, um, you know, even just using the word trajectory, it sounds like a, it was going in, in some uh, particular direction. I, I certainly hadn't chosen any uh, direction for it. And, and and I'm not saying if that's good or bad. Uh, it's just that you know I um, yeah you know, let my life un unfold, and yeah I I took opportunities that were presented to me. I you know took some chances, some risks, never anything uh, d dangerous, but uh, I, I was open to new experience and. And so I, I, I got to have quite a few experiences. You grew up in New York City. Sorry. And that was, in and of itself, you lived a very interesting life in New York City. It seems like you were always having very unique personal experiences. I, I was very surprised to see that you typed up the notes of Joseph Heller, the author of Catch-22, who was a personal friend when you were quite young. Right. And it the, seems the, like, yeah. amazingly, you just, your life intersects with all these famous people, um, which says something 
about how open-minded you are, but also just how far reaching your interests were. Yeah, and of course the, the connection with uh, Joe Heller was, I, could, I would almost say, you know, purely chance. He was, he was a neighbor uh, uh, for someone I was working for at the time. I was a mother's helper, which is a, a type of babysitter. I was about 15 when I met him. And he, he just offered me this summer job of typing the dialogue from Cats 22 and, you know, said, you know, would I like to, to do it and make a little extra money for the summer? And I said, sure, and, and did it. And I had no idea uh, who he was. And of course, I, I found out, you know, right away um, that he was the author of this, yeah, well, very well received novel. But he was a literary phenomenon, uh, really, and you know changed so much of the culture at, at the time. But I knew him as Joe Heller, someone you know <laughs> I hung out on the beach with, and who you know uh, notes I, I typed in the in the afternoon. Ben, did you? Yeah, so I had a question anyway, but the way you open it really gives me a great opportunity to ask it. And you mentioned about your life being unplanned. Uh, as I said before, I'm really interested in the, the narrative of this text. And I've made no secret that I really enjoyed this book, uh, that it was extremely compelling. And I think I read it in three sit downs and, and just really felt glued to the pages. And, and so that led me think, well, why? I mean, now, first of all, I happen to have lived in some of the same places you've lived besides Japan. And so that's sort of what brought me. But what kept me was your voice, or at least the voice of the character that you've created that is representing you. And I felt that there were two really strong voices, that mm -hmm. there was one that was kind of omnipotent, not kind of omnipotent, omnipotent, that knew how things were gonna work out. And that was telling the story from the present. But then there was this interjection of the 15 year old typing up uh, the notes, right? From Catch-22. So that was there in the moment and didn't know how things were gonna turn out and wasn't so right. world wise. And, and, and there were the almost, I don't know if it was two voices or whether it was one voice, two, two parts of one very strong voice, mm -hmm. but at different times I felt each one coming off the page more strongly. And when you say unplanned, it's interesting because I guess the unplanned part it's, now it's you looking back on your life. Right. It's kind of unplanned, but that's in sort of the omnipotent, I know how things are gonna work out voice. But I did feel that unplanned part very much as being the chief characteristic of the girl, young woman, woman, worldly wise woman right. uh, across the, the pages of your, uh, of, of your book. So am I right? And if I'm, <laughs> whether I'm right or wrong in my, in my assessment, what do you think right. about how you created the voice, your voice? Right. Um, I, again, I, I would say the the unplanned part that, that, that it's just totally real. You know, I I, I didn't ma make up uh, anything, and if I had said, oh, when I'm uh, 24, I will go to Japan and you know finish a, a degree, and uh, after that, you know, I, I hope to be married and I'd like to have a, a you know a family. And if, if it came about, you know, uh, great. But I didn't say any of those things ever. And yeah, um, you know, having my first child when I did and traveling uh, uh, as I had when, well, then, you know, way before that, going to uh, Europe the first time on my own when I was, was 19. I, I didn't know what I would find in in, in your bed. I, you know, really, you know, I had no no idea. But I I was interested, and yeah, I, I think I would have been satisfied even even um, you know if I had just done what was my original intention was to visit all of the great museums of Europe, the Rijksmuseum and the Prado and the Louvre and the British British Museum, and and I did all of that. But then the experience of just being in f foreign countries and interacting with people of you know different nationalities and hearing all of these different languages and 
eating, you know, foods I'd never heard of, of let, let alone you know, tasted it. It really uh, op opened a, a, a world. So there, there is that, the, the, the young woman discovering the world. But of, of course, by the time I'm writing the, this story, I, I've, I've made a lot of those discoveries. So I kind of, you know, have to, I guess, move back between those, those voices. Uh, one is, um, yeah, uh, yeah, and innocent in, in terms of really not knowing uh, much of the world. But by the time I write my, my memoir, I am, you know, uh, a, a mature woman and, and, I, and I have a voice and it, it's an authentic voice. Uh, it's my experience and I, and I feel like, you know, I was a, able uh, to, to capture it starting from being an adolescent, a teenager, a young woman, a young mother, and, and, um, and just moving on from there. And at one point, uh, you said that you create the character. And I feel, you know, that's what you do when you write fiction. But in, in memoir, you, you are the character. I, 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 am, I am the character. It's, and, and I've got to be the one that the reader uh, can relate to, can picture, can sympathize with, um, can yeah, see, see themselves in, in, in some way. And if I were a phony, <laughs> And you know, and I was like trying to grab the the readers. And, you know, I, you know, there there were the different there are different devices. Um, I, I think a writer can use, but I I, I can say I, I feel I about the voice. It's just that it's an authentic voice. It, it's me. It that's who I am. That really strikes me as I read through your life trajectory. Is that really shouts out the authenticity. Mm -hmm. that you were really true to your your values and that you were you know deeply rooted in a set of moral values and i suppose that may have been religious because you mentioned i think the funeral of your father and you quote what the pastor says i was moved to tears by that uh -huh. um and it seems like your father had a great influence on on your moral grounding you said that he was uh, quite strict but seemed to be a man of real gravitas and raised you as a single father. Uh, that's true. And um, well, in, in the memoir, I quote from the eulogy um, and it, it wasn't a pastor, it was actually a, a friend of his, uh, Mr. Taylor. Um, and my father w was religious, uh, absolutely. And uh, as I write in the memoir, when um, he was, well, in the hospital and, and literally uh, dying. I, to, to comfort him, I, I went and, and got a Bible, you know, to read to him from it because I thought it would comfort him. But uh, make no mistake, I am not religious at all, like not in any way whatsoever. I don't identify with any uh, religions and, um, I, do, I don't want to now get into what I, I think of religions in, in, in general, but I, I am not a religious whatsoever. And yet your husband seems to be, I don't know if religious is the right word, oh, no, but, he's not. No, he's but not. in terms of, it seems like one of the appeals uh, for Japan for him was Buddhism and meditation. Right. But, but uh, totally from, I would say, a philosophical, from right. a humanistic, from a secular perspective. Uh, he's not not religious, and it, you know he did um, practice Zen and uh, meditated and did zazen and, and all of those things, but n not uh, as a person was religious. No. I, you quote a, someone who was um, had a, a notable comment to you that you were very educated but not schooled. And perhaps you were very spiritual without being religious, if you know it, if, if that I, distinction. I've heard sense. that. Um, yeah, I, I won't cop to that. <laughs> okay, well, well, maybe I'm just projecting here. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, one place I see that, and Ben, you could speak to this better than me because you teach a course on food cultures at the university, is one through line throughout your entire life and your husband's was a real commitment to healthy eating and and 
um, veg, if not vegetarianism, then, you know, healthy Antibiotics. food. And yeah. yeah, and that was, you mentioned that quite frequently throughout there. So that seems to have been an important part of your life. It, it was uh, absolutely. And, and as uh, I mentioned, my husband was one of the very early uh, members of the macrobiotic community in, in the right. United States. And, and was a chef at restaurants. Yeah, and, 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 and was a chef. But I mean, he, he embraced uh, macrobiotics and before that vegetarianism at a time when you know, most people just uh, had no idea what those things were, had never seen brown rice, let alone eaten it. Um, but yeah, he got into it and I guess you could say he turned me on to it. I was, thought it was, was interesting and um, embraced it to some extent. I, I, I followed macrobiotics at different points in, in my life, but I was never part of, of the movement whatsoever. I, number one, I don't tend to join things, uh, absolutely anything. I don't tend to follow um, movements or people or yeah, I, I well, I wouldn't say ideas. I I don't know. I'm I'm sure there are some ideas that I embrace. So, the uh, the, it's interesting the food timeline, and uh, mm -hmm. I also thought that a really I was interested in the housing timeline, or the lack of housing. Uh -huh. uh, times when you're out on the road in Europe, or when you're staying with people, or when you're building your own home, and then refurbishing someone else's home, and then finally you have your own home that you build. And uh, I, of course, I, I thought of the food and it was interesting, uh, but I think the, the home, homelessness, new home, right. going home theme really is all the way through. Right. Is that something you would talk a little bit about? Yeah, well, first of all, we won't say homeless <laughs> because that uh, in, in you know, 2021 conjures up something, well, pretty horrendous, especially when we think about the, the United States. Yeah, I, I uh, uh, wasn't settled for a, a number of years and, you know, didn't just move from, you know, to different homes, but, you know, to different countries. And it, it, it became... Yeah, not so much a lifestyle because it wasn't something again that I was thinking, oh yeah, it's cool, you know, not to have a home and to always be on the move. It was what I was doing that what that was in my, my life and, and how it was uh, unfolding. But, um, and, and I think I, I make this clear that after my first daughter w was born and, and of course it's natural, um, I think for all, all women, all mothers, uh, certainly, but maybe, you know, for families too, to want to nest, to have a, you know, a, a place that, that's stable. And so that b became something a, a important to me. But again, not, not in, a, in, in a desperate sense, like, oh, I've got to get a home or, you know, I should stay in one place. So that's, um, yeah, um, I, I, I won't be, uh, you know, a success or, you know, right. a responsible adult, as my father would say, uh, uh, until I had done it. I, I, I guess I was confident enough, or, or I would say, uh, unworried about it enough to, to let it unfold that, um, yeah, it, it would happen or it would not happen. As it turned out, it, it did happen. One, one but, thing that I see in the writing is that mm -hmm. quite often, you reach a moment uh, uh, like an epiphany where you realize I've got to move on from this and that you fear getting boxed in by a locale or a job or even a relationship. And that you were very much aware of like people trying to put limits on you either inadvertently, just right. in some cases living in a wonderful place where you could stay for a long period of time. You mentioned that as you're traveling by Volkswagen bus around the world, you realize that if you weren't careful, you could end up staying with people along the way for weeks or months at a time. You might never reach your ultimate destination. Oh, that's, well, yeah, when we started out um, to, towards the east, we had, well, there, there were two stops. Well, first in London, uh, Billy found a job in, in a vegetarian restaurant and, and they needed a chef at the time. So, so he did that. And then uh, while we were in, in Paris uh, and planning, you know, to start um, our trip um, 
to the east from there, we heard about someone who needed uh, help on a, a farm in the south of France. So we thought, well, um, that'd be a nice place to spend the, the winter. And it was a very nice place. And just as we were about to leave there, we heard of this um, person, Eve, who um, was not well at, and, and, and needed help and we had been looking for a, a macrobiotic chef, chef actually. And so we, we went there and it, again, unplanned, <laughs> um, but, but they, they all turned out to be nice, uh, very good experiences. But I just wanted to push back a little bit on, on what you said before, um, mm -hmm. because it does, it, at least as a reader, and I, and I understand that, and I certainly understand and believe the, in the authenticity, that's a really important part of it. But when I say character, I mean how the reader experiences you. Oh, and, right, okay. And, 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 and in, in, in that sense, we only know a character, right? It, and we can also say, oh yes, well, this definitely matches with the real actual live human we know. But mm -hmm. in that experience, I, I did get a sense of an increasing settledness uh, mm -hmm. It was that had to have been planned because it, you know what I mean? The, the, you do become more and more settled and where you become settled is really, I think, a crucial part of the story that you be, you're settled in Japan. And unlike most of us that are here, there's no one that's, that's Japanese in your family, right? That, that, right but right. you're still here and you're, you're a real part of this landscape and you're a natural part. Right. And, and that, that has to have a little more than just random. There's that, that yeah. has, that no, actually, well, well, when you said I was thinking more of the time, say, when I was in Europe or in Vermont right. or, or whatever. But later, I mean, uh, certainly in Japan, uh, we became settled. But also, Ben, you'll um, recall in the, the memoir, I, I say that I think at yeah, uh, we'd been here about 15 years before we got permanent residency. And it wasn't until then that, um, yeah, we said, well, <laughs> it's kind of like it looks like we're still here. I mean, we had originally come for a year. Um, and then it, it seemed to be a smart thing to, to uh, or reasonable to buy land and build a house. And, you know, and that's what we did. But also in the memoir, I say there was never, not at any point where, you know, Billy and I said, uh, Billy being my husband, um, well, let's, let's settle in Japan. This, this is the place that we, we sh should live. I mean, we were both settled here and, and, you know, I had made a home here and I had three children born, born here. But um, again, it, it it really wasn't a plan and it's almost unusual in a way i think you know in most um um partnerships or marriages relationships there's usually one person who makes a plan and the other person you know who um is, is comfortable w w without it but in the case of both of us we we were, really weren't making plans so yeah, and by the way, it, it, that's another nice feature of the book is that you, you, there is this partnership. You're obviously the, the main person, and it's your it's your narrative. But um, mm -hmm. I felt that was, you know, your husband kind of comes in and out in a way that's that you understand that this is a partnership, but it's not always, right. you know, said explicitly. But it's clear right. that that's worked out really well. So it's worked out like a, any marriage. <laughs> Well, sometimes not so well other times. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Uh, by the way, just a technical point here on our, when we archive this, we'll cut this point out. Someone's tapping. I don't know if someone's typing or whatever, but um, uh, oh, we're picking yeah. that up. Okay. And that'll prove to be intrusive. Um, so Karen, you were mentioning family mm -hmm. and marriage. Can you talk about the, your your marriage and your relationship and the influence that had on your life trajectory. It seems like you always knew at some level that you had a deep connection to your husband. And um, eventually, I think you said that you asked him to marry you. Right? I did. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. And actually, our children, because I've told them this story before I wrote the memoir, and they always say, Papa, how could you say no to Mama? <laughs> so yeah, the, you know, it, it, 
it turned out that uh, you know we, we did eventually um, get married. But it, again, that was one of those um, things, Ben, and, and you know, to go back to um, you know my life of being unplanned that when we got together and we really had you know been friends for about you know 12 years i mean since we were teenagers uh, very very good friends and just yeah in that one visit when i went uh to see him in boston i realized uh, i I really it was like an awakening um that uh oh this is the person i should should be with and and i tend to follow my intuition you, you see so no. I didn't even really hesitate to ask him to marry me. I, I mean, well, I mean, I'm not crazy or something like that, you know, or the, even that um, I, you know, I, I definitely have some some spontaneity. But, you know, I, I thought about it and, and, and he had been away the, the entire day um, at work and, and we were meeting together later in the, in the evening. But during the day, I, I made up my mind. It, it was, you know, literally in one day, oh, this is the person I should marry. And, and um, you know, he didn't ask me, so I'm going to ask him, why should I wait around? I don't mean, I don't, I don't even know what I was thinking at the time. It's just I, I had the, the impulse, the intuition, um, the desire um, that I thought well, we should be married. And now we are 46 years. Karen, I heard on an interview that you did with another source that they referred to you as a trailing spouse. Um, I don't know if I would characterize you in that way, but was your husband leading the way to Japan? Mm-hmm. That was in an interview. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I but I, I certainly oh. wouldn't characterize from what I've read or know of you of, yeah. of that being accurate. But uh, the point is, did did you end up in Japan largely because of your husband's influence and interest or was that something that you were because he was invited to the dojo and i don't know if you've come to that part in 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 the book but he was invited uh to study here in shizuoka prefecture and when when, um he accepted the invitation he he asked if i would would come with him and i said sure you know, he, he'd never traveled uh, abroad. I'd been to Europe already, I, I think, three or four times by that time. And I, right. it, it didn't seem anything uh, like anything particularly daunting uh, to me. But uh, I would never call myself a tra- trailing spouse. And, and if anything, Nor would I. No. Um, he, he, he was definitely hesitant uh, to do it. And I said, you know, this is something you've, you've wanted, you know, to do for the longest time now you have this opportunity you know do it and when he said would you come with me i i, I said sure yeah because you had made so many life transitions and once you would be someplace for a month or even a year was there a moment in time in japan where you came to the conscious realization that this is where you would spend your life i mean i asked that in part because when i first came to japan in like 1989 as I was studying the language, I had two different Japanese teachers tell me, you know, don't bother learning kanji because you're not going to be here long enough to, to make use of it, right? Well, here I am 30 years later. You've been here since 1975, right? But was there a moment where you said, this is my home? Yeah, I guess there was a time. I mean, I wouldn't be able to trace it back, but I think... I probably knew or felt that from the you know the time, definitely from the time our last child w- was born. But th- that was eighty three, and we you know had already been here uh, since seventy five. But yeah, I yeah probably in in the early eighties. I just you know I, I felt at home, and I didn't feel that there was some place else. I should be, or I wanted to be, or wanted to go go back to, and I I, I thought, yeah, I, I I've made a home here. We've made a, a home here, and um, yeah, this is fine. This works. Where you ended up in Shizuoka, a very rural area of Japan, were there many other foreigners there? <laughs> None. <laughs> yeah, None. that's the impression I got. Um, everyone, I recommend that you find the film by the documentary filmmaker, Reggie Life. Reggie has a film called Doubles and they have a 
a section of that video, a good 10 or 15 minutes about you and your family. I right. suppose that was made in the 1980s. I don't remember, but I think we're, uh, have a larger segment and are more featured in his film, uh, Struggle and Success. That's it. Right. Adversity and success, the African-American uh, so, experience in Japan. Struggle yeah, and success. Struggle. Okay. So that's yeah. the yeah. two films, one called Doubles and one called yeah, Struggle and Success. Right. Yeah. Doubles was the second one. So in that film, there's a scene that I just found so moving where your children, I, I think it was your daughters, are sitting with your husband. They're quite young. And they say to him, ah, Papa we wish that you could be Japanese like us. And he says, what are you talking about? You're not Japanese. You're, you know, you're American mixed heritage, whatever. And they kind of say like, what do you, like, what are you talking about? Of course we're Japanese. And they seem to have that unique experience of not only having grown up in Japan during virtually their entire life, but also in a very rural area uh, where they become thoroughly assimilated as part of that, small village right yeah that and i would say uh was again just so natural and and, and that's the, the the way it unfolded and of course as the children got um older they yeah but would you know question you know? Not to, not so much you know you know why are we here or, or whatever but it's it's clear you know they were different from absolutely everyone uh, around us and 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 that's still true there are literally no foreigners uh, where I live and in their schools all of the the, the uh, years that they went to public schools that there were never any any foreign children but it, it was never a big deal e either so. Um, I, I feel that even with the challenge of being different when, when you're a, a child, it it doesn't necessarily have to be a problem. And I, I never saw it as a, as a problem. And and I, and I think I, as a result, uh, neither did they. You know, when our son, I guess he was about 14, and, um, and we'd sent them to boarding schools uh, uh, for high school in the United States, he telephoned once and he spoke to my husband and, and he said, uh, Papa, what am I? And Billy said, well, what do you mean? What, what are you? <laughs> and he said, well, am I black or white or Jewish or, you know, Caribbean or Japanese? He said, you know, what are, American? He said, what am I? And Billy said, you're all of those things. And I feel like, I'm satisfied with that per person. I don't know if the world is, I do not care. Uh, I, I, I feel that they are all of the, those things. All of those, yeah. I will not use the word identity, I promise. <laughs> but all, <laughs> all, 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 they, they embody all, all of those uh, re realities. And, and you, your children are still in Japan now, right? Or some of your children? Yeah, yeah uh, some of them. Um, when you when you have four, they can be all over the place, and they have been all over the place. Right. But right now, our eldest daughter lives um, outside of New York City in, in the Hamptons, you know, on the Atlantic coast. And our other two daughters are both in Tokyo. And our son lives in Kyushu with his family. Actually, Karen, uh, mm -hmm. perhaps this might be an opportune time for me to show uh, the photo gallery from your, your web page oh, sure. where we can yeah. see. So I don't know if there's any particular photos you want to focus on here. No, well, the one in the middle there with uh, Billy and I, that, that's in Vermont, and that, that's just a few months before we left the United States for, for in Japan. And the one on the right is my um, doctor, the, my um, obstetrician, Dr. Mizumoto, 
who delivered Mario, who who is there sitting on his, his lap, and and also my youngest daughter. And to the left there is my husband Bill playing shogi with our neighbor at Futokuroyama, which is Breast Pocket Mountain, and you know sitting at uh, Kotatsu. And below that, that's also uh, Futokuroyama, which that that's where I took the title for the book um, and literally translated it as Breast Pocket Mountain. And that shows me dancing, uh, you know, for the Bono Dori the summer festival. Now, in the of, middle, mm -hmm. you, you were both a dancer and a model when you were in New York, was it? Or yes, I, I was. I, I I studied dance. I studied at uh, Martha Graham. But that particular photo um, is from high school, and our art history teacher took it. He just uh, he was. As a hobby, I, I guess you would say, uh, a photographer, and he just asked some of the students in the Martin dance class if you know we would pose for him, uh, just you know casually you know, do anything, and I took, <laughs> leapt up like that, and he, and he caught the shot. Um, boy, I couldn't do that now. Is all I can say. <laughs> hmm. Like not at that, all. But, that <laughs> may be the teacher that. You mentioned had a, a real strong influence on your life and was yeah absolutely really um, encouraged you all to explore. You seem to have a deep interest and in knowledge of art at a, at a young age, yeah, and I'm sure as you traveled there. throughout Europe, that was a great opportunity. It certainly was. And this is the big group here on the right. Oh uh, yeah, that's our um, youngest daughter, Leela, with her husband, Chris, at their wedding uh, in North Carolina. That was three years ago. And it, if you can see that photo of family, friends, extended family, I, I feel like now you, you know who and what the Anton clan are. That, mm. that, that's us. That's cool. Now here's an opportunity to brag on your children. Um, uh, I think they're, they're all now in their careers and yes, they are. taking advantage of their multiculturalism, Japanese fluency and the good sense that you instilled in them. So what are yeah. they doing? Yes, uh, let's see. Uh, our eldest daughter who I can't say is in the middle, um, but with the striped dress, she is a textile designer. And she's a graduate of uh, the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, the second daughter on, on the, the right um, is the one who lived in Stockholm for a, a while and, and also studied in China. Uh, and she's now a director at Nike in, in Tokyo. And on the far left, our youngest daughter, who studied in Ghana, um, is a director at Netflix. And our son uh, lives in Kyushu. And until the um, you know this um, pandemic, he was a senior licensed uh, government licensed tour guide with Walk Japan, which is uh, actually a world famous uh, tour group. Now he's uh, taken on, on uh, a different work, and, and uh, I mean he, he really had to to change because of COVID. Mm. And then you have a very high level of expertise in calligraphy. Uh, Nidan, uh, second degree, it took me more than twenty years. <laughs> They, they they do not give those dons out easily. I'll tell you that. <laughs> this is after a very long study. Yes. You must know the work of Alex Kerr. Oh um, yeah, absolutely. I, I admire you know, it. Alex also does high level calligraphy. And well, some years ago, I I took a group of Alex is the author of a book called Lost Japan, which mm -hmm. won the award as the best nonfiction book the year it came out. Um, and also won a translation award that he himself did, also a book called Dogs and Demons. Yeah. Um, and I visited him in Kyoto with a group of students one time. And as we were leaving, he had taken us to this very beautiful kind of elite tea ceremony. 
I asked him, what can you tell these American students that you could, uh, about how to learn more about Japan? And he said, choose a traditional Japanese arts, martial arts or calligraphy, whatever, and go really deep with it. And through that, you will really learn the culture. And so your husband in a different form of martial arts is surely, you know, getting deeply rooted into the the ancient tradition and you're doing it through calligraphy. It's true. I see the kitchen. Oh, oh, the old the great kitchen. kitchen. Uh, no, it wasn't a great kitchen. <laughs> it's a big kitchen. Well, it's, it's got space, but it was really, uh, you, you see the commodo there on the left. Um, that, you know, that's one of those hearths built into the yeah. side of, of the wall. Now it was really primitive. I, I, I don't know how I did it, but of, of course uh, I, I did it with a baby on my back, as you'll see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you were professionally as a chef in more than one place, I guess. Yeah, well, but I wouldn't say as a, a profession. I, I, I did it. Um, I could, could cook um, and I can cook. I, I, I think I'm a pretty good, good cook, but I, I would never say I was professional. So one question I want to ask you, Karen, was mm -hmm. having been here since 1975, you you lived through the pivot point of the, the, you know, the bubble economy collapse. And I came here in 1989. And, and just in a couple of years after that, by the mid 90s, Japan had really noticeably changed. And I suppose if you go back to 75 through the 80s, that's when Japan is really building up the miracle economy. Can you talk about those transitions of having lived in Japan for this extended period of time of how Japan has evolved and changed as you have alongside it, having lived here all those many years? Right. Well, first, I, I would say I, I would probably only think of myself as just peripherally um, involved or even aware of in the, the bubble economy. It wasn't until you know, I started um, doing corporate work that I, I could you know, see how um, these large corporations were affected, et cetera. But in, in my daily life and general life, I, I was hardly um, yeah, touched by it. And for me, really, when I um, think of what what's the biggest change I've seen, what, um, what is, is really different um, in, in Japan, well, of course, there are many things, but, but one of the things I, I think of uh, as number one, uh, for, since uh, 1975, and, and looking at, at the time now, is that there are many, many, many more foreigners here, many, many more foreigners. And and of course, not. I'm not talking about tourists or people who who come and just, yeah, and, and not even just, but you know, but who, people who live here for a year or two or study, and um, you know, acquire some proficiency and and, and maybe leave. But, but people who've made a uh, home here, it's, there are many, many, many uh, more foreigners. And as I said, wh where I live, there aren't any, but. Um, that's because I'm so far out in the countryside. But if I go into town, I will definitely see a foreigner. And years ago, if we, you know, saw a foreign person, oh my goodness, you know, you would accost one another. You know, hello, uh, do you speak English? Uh, where do you work? Uh, come to my house for lunch. <laughs> you know, that's that's really um, how it would go down. But now people are yeah well i would say pretty cool or really uh, and and it's like seeing foreigners is normal and, and and i guess it is and in in the area where we live uh um which is north of the city of hamamatsu in, in the city of hamamatsu quite a few uh well foreigners brazilians of japanese uh ancestry um uh, live there and and work in you know the local industries and now if you go into uh, uh, a bank or you know or use an atm 
Whereas before you you needed to know the kanji for withdrawal and and deposit, but now you you can get it in Portuguese, and it's like and they had Portuguese before they had English, but they they have it in both now or in hospitals that you know they have signs uh, pointing you to their radiology department. None of this uh, existed before. None of this. So I really feel, in that sense, Japan has really crossed a, a bridge and, you know, accepted the fact that there are more foreign people living among them. And I, I think I know your answer because you mm -hmm. have this you have this optimism. Uh, for example, you describe your children as being okay the way they are, or whatever they decided. And if the world has a problem with it, that's the world's problem. So I think I know your answer already, but. Um, accepting foreigners, but will Japan accept foreigners as becoming Japanese in effect? Because your children also do have that claim. I mean, they grew up here, they went to school here, they speak the language as well as any person with right. a Japanese, Japanese parent. So do you think Japan will accept? Uh, that's one step, the Portuguese right. at the ATM is one step, right. the next step. But this, I mean, when you say accept as Japanese, um, as a normal again, part of this landscape, like, without well, well, I mean, I feel they are a normal part. But whether you say whether they accept it as Japanese, uh, you know, officially or uh, legally, then that's a different thing. And I mentioned this in the book: the laws of nationality and and, and citizenship vary from country to country. And uh, you're American, right, Ben? I'm an American. You, 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 yeah, yeah, yes. um, have American citizenship. Right. As you know, and, and I say this too in, in the book, if a, a Japanese couple had g gone to the United States and settled there as we have settled here, any children they had born there, and if they had four children, those four children would be Americans because that's the uh, law of citizenship in the United States. In Japan, it's different. And it may change, I, I don't know, but um, I, one, I'm not particularly concerned about it, but, but two, I do accept that it, it's different in, in all countries. Our, our daughter, uh, the eldest daughter is born in Denmark. She's not uh, Danish. She has uh, no claim to Danish citizenship. She might have been at an earlier stage been able to apply for it and you know based on the fact that she was born there but yeah um i don't think we get to, to make those rules and those laws uh, i understand you know. so let, let me rephrase more clearly okay, what sure. i mean is that the acceptance of the idea that japan japan means people that aren't of Jap japanese ancestry right, right. Japanese ancestry. already obviously japan is more mixed than it's claimed a lot, a lot more people right. from korea and china and that are here that have come recently and are just, you know, either quiet about it or thought of as Japanese. But I mean, people from right. where we're from, uh, that when people think of Japan, they of course include right. the attorney from Brazil and and you and me, and, you know, and other mm -hmm. people here. That's what Japan is. I mean, for example, I right. lived in Japan for a long time and there was a Scandinavian family. I don't actually know where they came from because we only spoke Japanese together. Right. Uh, and we were at my daughter's um, uh, gymnastics class and. They were just a normal part of the landscape of little yeah, kids yeah, right. gymnastics, right? Nobody really called attention to it. So that's what I mean. We understand that right. about America. We understand that about Europe, right. um, but not yet about Japan, right? The, of yeah. course, you're going to meet people from all over the world in Japan. And of course, when they meet each other, they're going to speak Japanese, not English, right? right. I just wonder yeah, if we're headed in that direction. Yeah, it's just, uh, I mean, now it's, it's just like, it's not strange. And, you know, in fact, my um, one of my daughters in Tokyo, told me um what was it you know her youngest son um just well just said graduated from a uh, hoi Kuen, from nursery school and i don't there, there are just a you know a few uh, children uh, in, in the class and i don't know maybe 12 or, or yeah I, I i don't think there were more than that and she told me three of them are, are foreign and and not counting her her own son and, it's it's almost like more than I can imagine. I, I am really quite serious. She also told me that she um, she took a taxi in Tokyo. I, I don't know if it was about six months ago, or whatever. And the taxi driver was foreign. I just I I've never seen that. I literally have never seen it. Of course, I don't live in, in Tokyo, but you know, I've been in Tokyo a lot and used taxis a lot. Never 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 seen it. 
and coming from a country where it would be unusual now in New York City to have a taxi driver that is not foreign born. Unusual, really. I remember that transition over the course of my childhood. Yeah. Taxi drivers were going to be a white ethnic immigrant American right. now, and then all of a sudden they're from all over the world, right? So absolutely. But actually, you can, in, in Tokyo, you, you do you do meet uh, visibly non-Japanese, for what we understand Japanese to mean people in kombini and and uh, right, right, places. right. But have you? Uh, <laughs> I feel it's kind of crazy, but have you had a, a non-Japanese taxi driver? Yes, I have. Oh. Okay. And, all, and the construction crews also that are building new houses are wow. very often. Um, wow. I what I understand that to be Japanese, but you know, again, I'm relying on a, a set assumption of what it means to be Japanese. So. Right, 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 right. Yeah, and, and, it, which, and, and I know. I mean, the, the, you know, questions about it, whether you know, you're, yeah, you know, yeah, not just call Jap Japanese, but recognize as Japanese, and. And in fact, our youngest daughter did an interview that's, uh, I believe, up on, on YouTube. And, you know, she did the interview entirely in Japanese and with uh, a person of Japanese parentage, and he's born in the United States. And I don't think his Japanese is quite that to the level of hers. And then, you know, they were talking about all um, sorts of different things. And at one point, uh, I think she, she said, well, I am Japanese. And I was watching and I was thinking, well, no, you're not. <laughs> it's like, I happen to know who you are or whatever. But then I said, well, yes, she is. You know, again, I mean, if she wants to claim that as her identity, you know, she was born here, she grew up here, Japanese is her first language. Um, you know, she'll make mistakes speaking English, but she'll never make mistakes speaking Japanese. And, you know, and so it, that, that that's um, who she you know wants to be. It's not only who she is, but she's certainly uh, also Japanese. Yeah. And then, uh, again, yeah. Oh, okay, please. Yeah. Just yeah, we're talking about internationalization here. Um, you must have known Donald Ritchie. I'm sure you cross yeah, paths uh, with him. Of course. Do you see? I dedicate yeah. him. Uh, he's in the dedication of my book. Yeah. I'm so surprised, and maybe I shouldn't be, that many of my students have really never known of Donald Ritchie, who came here in 1947, wrote some 40 books, and became probably the world's leading critic on Japanese film. Mm -hmm. And he said one time in an interview, someone asked him, how could you be a foreigner and live in Japan? And he said, it's the only way I could live in Japan, because okay. the rules don't apply to me, and I can kind of somehow transcend that. Now, I told that to a friend who knew Donald Ritchie, and they said, well, yeah, that's Donald. He was very irascible and right, almost right. rebellious and almost took pride in that. But you seem, I, I'm making assumptions here just based upon what I've read about you and known about you, that you and your family assimilated very deeply, you know, and so rather than be on the outside looking in, you're really an active participant, a member of this society and that you don't look at it from that externalized distance. And yet in your writing, you talk about after you'd gone to Europe, you came back to New York and you said something about, wow, New York is so dirty. And a friend of yours said, Karen, this is New York, it's always been dirty, but that it seemed like it had become a foreign place to you. Right. So can you speak to that um, positioning of yourself in relationship to the culture? Right, I think, um, in my in my particular uh, case, that I never really felt I had to do something so much. Certainly, I, you know, I um, was not interested in well, it doesn't sound crazy appearing Japanese, <laughs> uh, but that yeah, that I I didn't have to work at it to to. Um, accept the, the society or, or I would say first adjust and, and adapt and finally accept the, the society that I've chosen to live in. And I, I know as a foreigner, I could almost I could get away with certain uh, things that, you know, uh, no Japanese woman, for example, uh, could. But I, I wasn't interested in that. I, 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 I wanted to participate, to cooperate and to 
Yeah, understand what, what was expected of me and, and, uh, and, and my role. And, you know, there were times when you know, I felt I needed to rebel or, you know, wanted to rebel or and did re re rebel, but, but not in any, you know, in your face uh, kind of way. But I, I, I think w when it was clear to me this is where I live. This is where I've chosen to live. This is where I'm making my home. This is where I'm raising my my children. I want it to be the best experience possible, uh, certainly for for my family and, and for everyone I, I interact with. And you know, I, I you know I, I could I would say you know focus on the fact of my difference, um, and I definitely am different. I, I can tell you. I never run into anyone who looks like me. Not ever. Not ever. Though, though actually, three years ago in in the the was shopping mall or whatever, I I I saw a young black man and we um, spoke to one, one another. But as I said, um, you know, the not only are there there are no foreigners uh, around where I live. There's definitely uh, no uh, people with my skin hue but I, I i i would say well that's the most obvious thing about me so what well, i mean as, as long as, why would you even comment on it do you know i'm also the tallest person and i'm not very tall but i'm taller than every, any japanese woman i ever see i'm i'm uh you know uh what's it, 170 uh, centimeters not very tall but but i there is no photo that you'll uh, see of me with a group of with, you know, dancers or, at, you know, at a school uh, meeting or giving a, a lecture or even now I, I, I uh, take a hula class and not only am I the, the tallest person, I have the longest legs, of course, and the longest arms and, and we do a lot of things where you have to put your arms out. They always have to give me extra room. I mean, we're, we're in for, formation, but I, yeah, it's you know that that difference is is there. But it it isn't a, an issue for me. It, 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 it's all I can say. And and if it were, well, I, I'd be insane by now, wouldn't I? And I'm not. But, you know, I think I I, I really <laughs> guess from as I see it, one of the takeaways from the book, one of the inspiring things of the book, is really about being an individual and yet being part of something naturally and normally and comfortably. Right. And that's the person that I meet in on the pages of the book. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it. I, I like it's that. Not easy to do. It's not easy to do. And it's not easy to do in, in maybe it's not so easy to do in Japan, although things are changing. Yeah, things are changing. Well, if you think it's not easy to do it in what you say in Japan, do you live in Tokyo? I do. I'm in Tokyo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, come to tend you. <laughs> it's different, but I, but I, I actually I don't I because I don't want to malign my neighbors. Certainly, in a way, it's almost it's. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't say it's easier, but yeah, mainly I, I you know I live among pretty simple people, very, very uh, simple people, and then it's kind of like they they take you as they they find you, and but that, it you know, really is that way, isn't it? Uh, that yeah. you the two people that don't. Nihongo Jozo, you are people that are very sophisticated and people that don't even think about these things. Don't even think about They're just it. <laughs> doing their work and, and art yeah. and meet them and you speak Japanese and they don't ask you when they you're don't. going home or. Yeah, I know, they don't blink. Sushi, they're just, okay, you're buying daikon, here's your daikon and I want my two. Exactly. Oh, that's a yeah, good example because there was actually, um, it's not there now, but a small vegetable stand. Um, not you know maybe just a five minute drive from us and I would stop there sometimes and the the farmers would take turns they would alternate of who was um you know selling them the vegetables and often of course I, I would recognize some of these farmers but but even if I didn't you know and I, I went there, I bought you know daikon or renkon or mitsuba or whatever no I mean no one would say Oh, you know the word for mitsubar or you know, something like, or do you know what, 
do you know what to do with it? Or, or if you buy Gobo, you know, they assume, uh, you know, I can make Kimpira if I buy Gobo. So, yeah, it, it, you know, it's, it's just a, a normal interaction, really. Yeah. And those are really wonderful, I think. Yeah. In, in Japan. Uh, Karen, I, I see from your resume mm -hmm. that you have served as a consultant or been in some, maybe as a board member or some professional capacity with almost, it seems like a dozen American organizations and, and another 20 or so Japanese organizations, some of them corporate. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about that experience? Like when you've been enlisted in those roles, what has been your contribution? Do they see you as kind of a reality check on internationalization as a, oh, as no. a person to provide, you know, advice and to ways right. to make them more internationalized? Right. Um, well, yeah, I, I normally don't talk about uh, corporate work because, of course, there are, you know, are privacy um, concerns. But, you know, when I first started um, working in the corporate world, first in Kobe uh, with Eli Lilly and, and then in Tokyo with, um, well, ac actually Ito Chu, and that was through um, uh, my... Uh, introduction uh, through Temple, but um, later with, with Citibank. And I, I was asked to, to come on a, as a consultant because they were familiar with, with my uh, work for the Japan Times with um, the, the column I, I did, Crossing Cultures. And that my first thought was, Oh my goodness, you know, I can't work in a corporate world with capitalists or whatever. But then, you know, when I, I began, uh, I, I really made the switch uh, very fast because I realized I was always working with people. And these um, programs, uh, they asked me uh, to develop, develop or the consulting I did was there were always uh, employee uh, development programs to improve the uh, workplace environment. So uh, I um, did a you know, cross-cultural competence uh, training and, and consulting, also assertive communication, um, my favorite work-life balance, though uh, <laughs> no one seemed to, to really uh, em embrace it. Um, yeah, time management, uh, harassment pre prevention, and of course, uh, d diversity and inclusion. And I always, now these days, I hesitate to, to even say that because if you say diversity, people, you know, that the head goes uh, one way. But in, in Japan, in, in 1999, uh, 2000, when they were uh, asked me to do diversity training, it was uh, to support their efforts um, for women um, in, in the workplace, that, that was re really uh, what, what it was about. Uh, more women were, were entering, and they, it was clear that they needed to create a, a, an environment in, in which women uh, could thrive and, and you know even have dreams of promotion if it were, were possible. And you know, we 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 focused on on, on difference, on difference of, of gender, um, nationality, uh, uh, disability, uh, all all of the I would uh, say all, all of the things that people bring to the workplace, and in, including of, of course different perspectives and viewpoints and uh, education, educational levels. Uh, people from different regions uh, of Japan even. And I, I felt that it was um, quite su successful in, in, in many ways that we were able to, to make changes in, in a number of these corporations. We're about, to, I think we should maybe move to Q&A. We, we only have sure. actually a couple of questions even though we have some 40 people here. The oh. last question I have for you, Karen, is, um, I remember seeing this, I'd mentioned the filmmaker Errol Morris did a film called The Fog of War with Robert McNamara. And Robert McNamara, not exactly a moral exemplar for us, perhaps said um, in a news conference, he realized that he shouldn't ask the question that he had 
been answer the question he had been asked. He should answer the question he wished he had been asked. So are there any questions that you wish you had been asked or that you would, if you were in a moderator role, put to yourself? Or, or you know, anything left unsaid that you think is especially important? Not anything that I, um, yeah, I mean, and especially now because I, you know, I'm doing a, a number of events, I get asked a lot of questions. So I, I, yeah, I can, can't uh, think of anything, uh, but did, what about Ben? Do you have any? Yeah, um, I actually questions? have one, one question, which is, uh, I know which part of the book felt most uh, emotional for me, but more importantly, what was, what part of the book that when you were writing it made you feel most connected to that event now, emotionally? Ooh. Wow, wow, wow. That's a good question. Mm. What would that be? What would that be? <sighs> Maybe when, you know, when I wrote uh, uh, about, yeah, the, you know, my life at Futokuroyama at Breast Pocket, Pocket Mountain when I was really uh, severely isolated and you know, with uh, young children and an uh, infant, and just I, I feel feeling that yeah, certainly not trapped, but I but that I didn't have um, anything really in my life to you know to feed me as uh, an an intellectual uh, human being who, who you know, needed um, more st stimulation and, you know, miss the company of people, just uh, people in, in, in general. And, and that I, I had so little of it. And it's, yeah, it, it's, it's a wonder. <laughs> I, uh, you know, did it as, as long as, as I did, but, but I did do it. And, uh, you know, again, as in, you know, many of the other decisions that I made when I realized, oh, I've done this enough. We moved, you know, that, that was it. But yeah, going going back to, to that time was, um, yeah, the, I, would say, I would say emotional in terms of, I mean, it didn't, didn't make me cry or something like that, but I, I, I could easily uh, see myself, uh, the, the, the young woman who I was at that time. Thank you. Sure. I hesitate to even ask this, but I uh, forgive me for this. But you spent an afternoon with Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us that story? Yeah, it was a, a very simple story, just as you know, I wrote about it in the book. They, they were looking for a caretaker. I forget even how I heard it, uh, about it, and I. Went, went to their home, a chalet in Stad in, in Switzerland. And I was sitting outside on, a, um, on their lawn on a very bright uh, Swiss day when the diamond walked out on the <laughs> terrace. It was really, it was huge. It's really, really huge. And, and as I say, dazzling, it, it, it was uh, spectacular. And I don't actually uh, write that in, in the book, but I remember uh, one Elizabeth said, oh, isn't it glorious? But the other thing she said was, are you, are you here like uh, we are because you love it so much? <laughs> I was really <laughs> not there in, in that capacity at all. I was, you know, uh, running out of places where I was going to go and, to, and stay and, and, you know, just kind of like ended up here in Switzerland. In any case, they, you know, they invited me in. They were really kind and warm and just uh, and entertaining. It was just wonderful, you know, to listen to them, you know, to tell the stories and uh, yeah, to, 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 to see these um, people who, you know, are quite glamorous and, you know, couldn't be more famous, uh, really. But again, and as I uh, close that, um, chapter out just uh, they were normal people well, what can i tell you and richard burton well, he was just really so nice and i i, I say he um, said you know i want to show you something and he took me to his library and it was beautiful it's just you know, it's, I mean, because there were quite a large chalet and and the library wasn't particularly 
big, but it had every copy of the Everyman Library. And he had been yeah. collecting it since he was uh, uh, just a boy in Wales and, you know, uh, certainly not well to do. He was a coal miner's son. But Elizabeth had all of these copies, what do you say, um, covered in uh, suede or doe skin or something. I, 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 just touching I mean, you, you, you couldn't imagine it's like this is even a book to read it was just such a lovely experience just touching something you know that was yeah it's, it's yeah beautiful no, but not delicate but yeah just, just nice to, to hold it was a really pleasant experience let me pay my last compliment before we get to the yes. uh, q a because actually one of the great things about your book is that all the people kind of appear as people and human, whether they're well-known or not, or celebrity or not, that all kind of is just sort of irrelevant in this democracy that you've created in your, on your pages. Oh, that's, uh, I really appreciate that too. So I'll make that my yeah. final Great. compliment. And, 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 but, <laughs> yeah, well, and I'll add, someone said to me, well, how, how could you be, you know, should, they said, you know, so normal around people like Joe Heller or Boscags or Liz Taylor or you know, Roberta Flack or, or, or whomever. And, and I thought, well, I don't know how, how else I would be number one. And, you know, I think, you know, some people um, feel, well, you know, if anyone in, you know, such an elevated, you know, position, wouldn't you feel, you know, intimidated? And I always think, you know, I never think of someone below me. So why would I think of someone above me? It, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, um, that struck me as that no one better, no one worse. That, and one of the reasons you could connect so easily to these famous people is you dealt with them as a person, not as a, not as famous a, representation of themselves exactly, or something. Not as, a name, you know? not as a name. I had seen this with Donald Ritchie, who, you know, had become quite famous that if people talk to Donald Ritchie, just as a regular person, he would talk to them as a person. Yeah. But if they talked to him as Donald Ritchie, his body language would change and he would that withdraw. Would yeah, clearly. Um, so we we have, um, there's no natural limit on a webinar. I mean, people can leave whatever they want. We have uh, 30 people here. Not so a lot have, of questions. We have some questions. Oh, do yeah. you have any questions? We do. I'll, I'll read them, I guess. Um, okay. I had asked a few people back channel if I could call on them, but there's, you know, we are recording this probably, it's going to be published publicly. So we need, you know, formal permission to use people's voice and face. So I, I guess I'll just for expediency sake, just ask the questions by proxy. This will be the difference between asking three or four questions and, you know, five or seven questions. So um, one person asked, seems like you followed what I think of as a 60s mindset to life, maximum experiences, take advantage of opportunities as they arise, look for internal satisfaction, one material. If I've understood this correctly, what is your assessment generally of the young people who you come across now who seem to be so overly career or goal oriented that they begin thinking about building the resume from middle school? <laughs> First of all, I don't come in contact with so many young people anymore. I live in the countryside where probably the median age is 80. But um, no, I mean, what can I say? Young people are, you know, they're the product of their time and, you know, and their experience and, and who knows how, how they may, may yet change or what changes they'll make in society so that it isn't as, um, I would say, incumbent upon them to start, you know, developing a resume in, in uh, yeah, middle school, or if in fact that, that, that that's what they're doing. But, and I want to say, I'm, I'm not knocking it because I, I, I don't know that that's not, not a, a good thing to do. It's, um, for some people, it, it may be. I, I don't like to think that young people limit themselves and, and you know, just following someone else's idea of what they should be or, you know, uh, the lives that they're expected to, to have. Right. But, um, yeah, I, you know, there may be some young, uh, you know, girls out there at, you know, the age of 12 and 13 that, you know, decided 
that you know they they want to study astrophysics at MIT and and they're they're clear about it and what they need to do to get there and, and if it starts it in middle school hey you know, maybe they'll make it I, I don't know thank you there's another question here you said that you didn't notice the changes brought by the bubble since that time what changes have you seen in your local community and for me to follow up on that mm. you know I, i've heard it said before that tokyo is not japan and japan is not asia mm. and so shizuoka is certainly not tokyo so having spent all those many years and then coming in and maybe in a professional capacity or to visit friends into tokyo back and forth occupying those parallel universes <laughs> what kind of changes have you seen in your local community there in oh, Shizuoka? The biggest change here is the depopulation. You know, that right. so many, uh, you know, older people have, have passed away. And, and I would say all of the uh, farm farmers that I knew at Futokuroyama, the breast pocket mountain, ha have now passed away. And, you know, at age... 95 and 100 101 and you know i i've been to 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 uh, their funerals and it, the saddest thing is that you know they're they're not being replaced their um yeah their progeny um their you know sons and daughters uh grandchildren are not you know, starting to do rice farming or you know, taking right. over you know the, the land or whatever a lot of people you know they leave this is um, yeah. It, it's so it, it's very sad to, to see. I, when I go up to our old, old village, it's you know it's um, yeah. What can I say? It's um, it, it, it's really uh, quite sad because you know it's not being uh, re replenished. It's just, yeah. you know, when when we lived there, there was you know three generational families. There was all there were always children or a baby being born. This doesn't exist anymore, and and our local town is literally um, has just it's almost closed up in front of our eyes. Uh, you know, there's no supermarket. Um, there's one butcher; she's she's still going strong somehow, <laughs> but almost like there there's, there's there's literally almost nothing nothing there. Every every store is shuttered, basically. So. Wow, that, that, that's a big change. And I remember that that uh, Shoten guy when, you know, they were making okonomiyaki and taiyaki on the street. And one there was a place, um, restaurant that sold unagi, uh, the kabayaki, you know, where it's roasted on, on charcoal. And, and they did it right um, at the front of the restaurant. So it was, uh, you know, um, out on, on the street, basically. And you could not pass this place without thinking, I've got to eat unagi. You know, the, you know, the, uh, yeah, the, the scent of it was just uh, the aroma. Uh, so, um, yeah, enticing, uh, really, beckoning. And, yeah, and there was a futon store and a bookstore and, you know, I mean, just, you know, the things that you, you would find anywhere. It's all gone. Absolutely everything is gone. So I guess you have a kind of a nostalgia for the Japan that you knew in the 70s and 80s. I do, but I tend not to get stuck in those places. I mean, what are you going to do? You know. Well, yeah. Early in your life, you were moving so constantly. I mentioned Donald Ritchie. There's a scholars network that had this annual conference called Urban Typhoon. And they had asked Donald to speak about in Shimokitazawa, they're bringing this big expressway over near Megiddo this big interchange, which is going to run right through Shimo Kitazawa. And they wanted to enlist him to come out to condemn this and to speak about, you know, maintaining traditional Japan. And he quite pointedly just shrugged it off and said, it's like trying to change the weather. You know, that I guess of kind of fatalism, having seen all the changes since the 1940s, going right. through the Olympics and now. But was there a moment in time where you thought there was a dramatic change or was this just a very gradual incremental process no i um i i, I think it was gradual I, I i didn't see it like oh wow you know so every, you know everything is has suddenly changed it's, it's, it's gradual it's been you know all, all, over time and 
certainly over our, you know, 46 years or whatever. Um, I can't think of, yeah, maybe when they started closing, you know, the schools, because now that, you know, the, the Shogakko, I, I think maybe three of them have closed or the, the elementary school that, and junior high school that my eldest daughter went to no, no longer exists, you know, and, and there are quite a, a few of those. Yeah, I, I, I guess it was, it was gradual, I, I would say. Yeah, mm. nothing, nothing shocking. You know. We have another question about the process of your writing. Mm -hmm. okay. um, asking, why did you choose to write the memoir now? And can you discuss the process? You know, what inspired you to write it now and the process of writing it? Well, sure. Um, I, yeah, the, I had, you know, uh, started uh, actually writing the memoir, oh, maybe it was, you know, seven years ago. I, I, I honestly uh, don't remember. And, you know, I, I put it away, it was in my, my drawer, and I, I wasn't really thinking about it. But I, about three years ago, I realized, you know, that this is something I want to do. This is a story I want to tell. And it's, it's, it's not, you know, um, something, oh, I just want to leave it to my children or whatever. I, I, I thought, you know, that there would be uh, people in, in, in the world interested uh, to know my story, uh, the trajectory of, of it, um, you know, how things uh, turned out. And actually, you know, I, I uh, approached, uh, um, you know, sev several publishers and literary agents, and they would all say, um, well, what what what's your demographic? You know, who who are you targeting? Um, who do you want? You know, to, to read this memoir. And I just I, I had to reject that out of hand. I I thought, well, what, I mean, what do you want me to say? Do, uh, women or women from New York City or women of uh, uh, middle age or or you know men. Uh, you know, young men or, you know, Japanese. I mean, I, I, I honestly uh, did not w want to, to answer that. And, and they would tell you very pointedly, don't say everybody. But that's exactly who I, I wanted my memoir to, to be for. And, uh, and when I see the responses, the comments, the re reviews, that's just who it's reached, and and I, I I hear from men and women, from young people, from older people, from every ethnicity, and, and I I I think it um, is is a story that people can relate to, even if they only fantasize, you know, about the the type of life that, that I've lived. But a lot of people have also said that you know they can see uh, m many of their experiences and the experience uh experience i had especially uh, uh living in, in japan and other people too um young and old saying they felt inspired by it uh, that you know and i i don't know inspired to take up you know to learn something new or to travel or to you know I don't know, um, follow up on a relationship or whatever it was, but, but you know, that the, they uh, felt in, in inspired. And, and another impetus, uh, by the way, because I, you know, I, I had such a, a really wonderful opportunity in writing for the Japan Times to r write about my life and experience um, in, in J Japan. But I, I was always aware that my readers and and I had really devoted readers that they were only getting part of the story. You know, um, I didn't arrive in Japan full blown. I had a, you know, a life before uh, arriving here, and I thought I would I was ready to tell some of that story. 
Well, we're the, moving process, the, the process is called sitting down and doing the writing. I don't know what else yeah, to say. Yeah. I mean, the person well, you the know, question was that it's like, what was your process uh, for doing the writing? I think uh, we're about out of time, uh, approaching an hour and a half, but mm -hmm. I want to say about the book is, you know, I feel like I've known you, we've crossed paths, we've talked and many times over the years. And I was just so extraordinarily moved and impressed by the book and your life and your approach to the world as kind of an exemplar. Um, I admire you and the way you've approached your life, but the book is written in such a almost a poetic, lyrical way. It's very, I found myself quite emotional reading the book. Oh. Um, I, I think because the way you tapped into your own emotion and some of the antidotes you had told, but um, I can't recommend it strongly enough to people, uh, not just to learn about you, but to learn about, you know, how, how to live in the world and also about Japan. And Ben, you had a, um, a question. Your sound. Uh, In terms of writing, what's next for us, for you? But for uh, <laughs> my golden rule is I never talk about writing. I, I think that that's just the way to not get it done. So um, I assure you, you will hear about it <laughs> when that time comes. Well, I want to encourage you, Karen, in addition to the book that you've written, think about collecting the artifacts of your life, because in the grand parade of historical, you know, foreign figures, you, you are a person in that, you know, you, you've lived a, a very unusual life and, you know, kind of pivoting off of your experience, you learn something about Japan. So I want to, if I could share my screen here, just to uh, raise attention to the book one more time. Um, this is a, uh, Sharon's book, you can see that it's available through uh, Sinyume Press. Uh, Karen has a really wonderful website. And uh, is, uh, are they, they going to uh, link for that? No. Yeah, we'll include it on the when we publish this online eventually. Okay. Um, there you can see um, Karen's website is karenhillantot.com, right? And um, I'm, I'm sure the information is there and it's available in various formats. So in right. addition to this, I also wanted to mention um, that this will be kind of published. It'll take us a week or two to pull it together. But since uh, coronavirus has forced everyone online, we had started this multimedia portal called ICAST. Again, right. this is through Temple University of Japan's Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies. We've done about 17 or 18 either podcasts or webinars. In this case, we have both this uh, video webinar that will be parked on the TUJ website and it will also be up on YouTube. So we had some 40 people today, but over the next number of years, I'm sure hundreds of people will see the video. So this is, um, this is called iCast. Yeah. Ben, thank you for, for joining today. And Karen, thank you for your book. Thank and, you for your just time. One last thing I, I would mm -hmm. say, um, if any people are still there, that anyone who wants to uh, write to me directly or ha have any questions you would like to ask, uh, please feel free. You can uh, write to me at karenhillanton at gmail.com. And you can be certain I will answer you. And is there a way if they go to your web page, well, can they access, can they contact you through your homepage? Yeah, well, well, they would they would get the um, my email address. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And, if, uh, mm -hmm. and everyone, if you have any questions about the recording, you could contact me, Kyle Cleveland, at Temple University. So once again, thanks so much. This was great. This is wonderful. Okay.